only mode. Hi everyone, my name is Lynn and I will be your host for today's event. We're going to go ahead and get started. So at PPP, our main focus is to help promote roadway safety through customer education and providing quality products. So we're excited to bring today's presentation on the basics of pavement markings using thermoplastic to you and we thank you all for taking the time to join us. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to review. First off, we have a lot of 90 minutes for today's presentation, including time for a Q&A session at the end. The lines will be on mute throughout the entire event, so please don't wait to ask your questions. Questions can be submitted at any time using the question chat box, and you can get to that by clicking the blue flower icon in your taskbar. There are a lot of people on the line today, so if you don't get your questions answered in the time allotted, we will make every attempt to get an answer to you via email. And again, the lines will be on mute throughout the entire event, and today's presentation is being recorded, so you will receive a link um, in your email shortly after for future reference, and please share that with your colleagues. So without, um, sorry, we're, today's presentation is being presented by Greg Driscoll, the president and founder of Professional Payment Products. Greg has only has over 20 years of industry experience, first as a contractor, then as a supplier. He is very hands-on with the development of our medallion product line of traffic paints and pavement maintenance products and the selection of our over 700 products that PPP currently carries. He's active in several trade associations, including ADSA, the ADSA Foundation, APWA, ITE, TRB, and ARTVA. And over the course of his career, Greg has been selected to instruct several LTAP and DOT training courses and present at several industry trade shows on various topics of pavement maintenance, pavement markings, roadway safety, and retroflectivity. So without further ado, please welcome Greg Driscoll. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I got to say, Lynn, it's, a, it's a dangerous when you forget your boss's name. So, uh, but anyway, I got lost uh, yes. in my in my script. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no script, so we could be in trouble today. Uh, well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I am Greg Driscoll. I'm the president and founder of Professional Pavement Products. Probably the most important thing, actually. I I just read a, an article on web presentations and said the most boring part of web presentations is the speaker introduction and the agenda. So, uh, so I'll be very brief, but, but do know that I, I do have uh, 21 years in the industry, uh, more than many, uh, less than some, and we have that experience actually in the contracting side and the supply side, mostly in the supply and product development side. We are active, very active, in many different associations, including the ASA and ITs and TRBs, ARPAs, and so forth. Uh, so we do, we do participate in those, those associations mainly for the sake of learning what the trends are and, uh, and actually how to, how to make sure those trends are positive. So let's get started. I believe uh, Lynn's going to tell me if, I've, if, if my screen is showing. Lynn? I'm at, I'm at presentation objectives. Can you confirm? Yep. All right, we're going to go ahead and get, okay, thank you very much. All right, so our objectives here uh, are twofold. One is we want to make sure that, that this training is real. And what we mean by real, we, we want it to be relevant, we want it to be effective, accurate, and logical. We want it to be relevant to those that are, that are here. That's why we give a good description of what this, this course is about. We want it to be effective, something that you can actually use, not just uh, a bunch of technical data that, that uh, you may find useful, useless on the field. Of course, it's got to be accurate, and that accuracy comes from many different things, including uh, publications and experience and so forth, and logical. And what I mean by logical is we have a, a vast array of folks out there uh, from, from experts to novice, uh, and we want to make sure that how we speak this, uh, the, the language we use, and, and the descriptions we give, that everyone can grasp. So that's a, that is probably the biggest challenge usually in a presentation like this over such a, a vast audience. Next is we want to promote quality practices, and why we want to do that is, is we want to improve safety. We want to improve safety of pedestrians. We want to improve the safety of motorists, and of course we want to uh, protect those that are out there doing the work themselves, and we think that these presentations do just that. 
Also, we want to maintain product integrity. Uh, no matter how great of a product that we help develop and make and distribute and get to you, uh, it does not do any good if you don't apply it if you apply it incorrectly. So we want to make sure that it's applied correctly because it's going to protect that integrity of that particular product. Also, maintain industry integrity. Uh, it's easy when a product is improperly installed or uh, unsafely installed for the entire industry to be affected by it. We saw this in Florida many years ago where the thermoplastic wasn't being installed quite right and it, and it really put the thermoplastic in danger here in the state of Florida. And, and the state of Florida being a, a leading pavement marking state, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm a little biased there, a lot of people could have followed. So it's very important to us to make sure that we maintain the integrity of the industry as well. So we want it to be real training and we want to promote the quality practices. And that's why we're here. All right, let's take a look. Uh, now you know more about us and about me. Let's take a look at you. Uh, when you look in the mirror, what do you see today? You see uh, that about 58% of you are government agencies. That's great. Love to see this because we know how important it is that uh, you're able to not just install but inspect, and we'll talk about that later through a poll, uh, the, the pavement markings and making sure that they're right for the motors. We go to uh, the next highest group is 25% is other. Uh, other is usually identified by, it could be, we actually have manufacturers and salesmen on there, uh, uh, different uh, property managers maybe and so forth. And we have 16.7% uh, make up our contractor side, and that is 12.5% uh, is pavement marking contractors, and the 4.2% is maintenance contractors. Usually that's a, about accurate for the maintenance contractors. It's usually lower. These are guys that do the parking lot striping a lot of times. They'll do uh, small paving jobs and so forth. But it's great to see that they're on board as well because we want them to understand uh, proper installation of thermoplastic, and it's usually these guys that are trying to expand their business. So to help us get an accurate count of how many people we've got out there today, we of course have the registrants numbers and, and names and so forth, but we'd really like to know, know in many cases you guys have uh, have multiple people sitting around the computer watching these, these webinars, and, and just for our sake of, of being able to track our, our influence and so forth, we'd really love for you to go into the question box there and just place in the number of people viewing from your computer. That would be great. I promise I won't send the bill. All right, today's uh, the second part of the boring uh, presentation uh, parts are, are the thermoplastic agenda, the agenda for today. Thermoplastic, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about thermoplastic and we're going to talk about retroreflectivity. We're going to go over the materials, the application and inspection of thermoplastic. And then we're going to go over the basics, measurement, and inspection of retroreflectivity. There's a lot of information in here. In fact, I, the courses that I do for, uh, for the Pavement Marking 101 and 102, including paint, thermoplastic, and retroreflectivity, is truly an all-day face-to-face course uh, that we provide. So we're, we're compacting this information into a very short presentation. So I think you'll still find it very, very helpful. In, uh, in your payment marking practices, but, uh, but just be aware of that. And I do speak very fast, so be sure if you come up with a question, type it into the question box immediately uh, so that you don't forget it and so that I can cover it at the end of the presentation. All right, let's get started with thermoplastic materials. What I'd like to know in this quick audience poll is what best represents your current markings materials mix. This is going to help me to know where you are as a group. So basically what I'm saying is, is that 100% is of what you do, thermoplastic, 75% thermoplastic, 25% other, 50% uh, thermoplastic, so on and so forth, or do you not even use thermoplastic at this time? And that would be 100% uh, paint or other. Please take a moment and fill out the poll and let us know where you are with it. And I'll give you a moment to do that, and then Lynn's going to tell us what the results of that poll is. All 
All right, Lynn, we're looking for some feedback. Okay. Let's see. I think we got everyone now. So looking at 13% are using 100% thermoplastic, about 20% are using 75% thermoplastic. We have 33% of you are doing about half thermoplastic, half other markings. Another 33% are doing 25% thermoplastic and 75% other markings. And nobody is using no thermoplastic that's on the presentation today. Oh, fantastic. So you all have familiarity with thermoplastic and the application of it and, and so forth. So this is going to be great a great course for you as well. It also helps me to know what the experience we have out in the field and uh, out in the, uh, in the audience, and it's going to help me go through the presentation in, in a little bit different way. Thank you very much for responding to that. Let's move on. Let's talk about material basis of thermoplastic. First of all, thermoplastic is provided in either granular or block form. It's heated to a liquid state, and then it's applied through either extrusion, ribbon, or spray systems. It creates a mechanical and or a heat fusion bond, and we'll talk about every one of these aspects as we go through. It cools from a liquid state to a solid state, and there you have it, a durable, reflective pavement marking. So it goes from a granular, you take a granular or block form, you heat it to a liquid state, you, you apply it, it creates a mechanical bond and or a heat fusion bond, and we'll talk about that and it cools to a liquid state, from a liquid state to a solid state, and again, you have a reflective, durable surface. Material packaging. Thermoplastic is either supplied in granular or block form. It is usually in 50-pound packages, and it's palletized by the ton, and it has about a one-year shelf life. So this is what the thermoplastic looks like when it comes in. It's either going to be in granular or block, mostly granular. I'll, I'll say that that in the old days, uh, in the late, well, let's say late 80s, uh, there was a lot of block material being used. Pretty much there's very little block material being used anymore. Uh, block is great uh, because it actually is pre-melted and then formed, so you know it's in good shape. You know it's going to melt fine because it's already been melted once, and it's easier to store. The granular usually is cheaper because they don't have to go through all that process. So, uh, so granular or block form, always in the 50-pound packages, and you usually buy it by the ton if you're buying it through the manufacturer, or even through us if you're buying truckloads or even partial truckloads, you'll usually order it by the pallet or by the ton. And again, it has a one-year shelf life. All right, let's talk about the components, the four primary components thermoplastic. First, let's talk a little bit about pigment. Pigment, of course, is what provides its color, and it also affects the material's opacity. Opacity is its ability to be seen through. The more opacity it has, the less you can see through it. Most of the pigments that are used are, uh, what, the primary one is titanium dioxide. This is actually, this is the white, uh, and and frankly, this is what's causing, in many cases, the prices of your thermoplastic to increase substantially over the last few years, is that TiO2 has become more and more expensive over time, harder to get, and more expensive supply and demand rule. Uh, this material is also used in, in many other products that are produced besides our industry. It's also used, of course, in paints as well, pavement marking paints. Yellow, yellow can either be a leaded yellow or an organic yellow. So we have pigments. Pigments, again, color opacity. Next, we're going to talk about resin. Now, resin is, is what controls the adhesion and cohesion of the product. Adhesion is how well it sticks to whatever you put it on, and cohesion is how well it sticks to itself. Now, there are two primary resins that we use here in the United States, which is hydrocarbon and alkyd. And we're going to go over more details on those two products in a moment, or those two resins. And of course, like most everything, it has filler. And the filler basically just adds body, gives body to the material. In thermoplastic, it's normally calcium carbonate that they're using to, as that filler. And then there's glass beads. 
And glass beads are intermixed. This is an intermixed glass bead. It's different than paint because paint you only put beads on top. In thermal plastic, it has an intermixed bead, and it provides for retroreflectivity. Now there are various types and sizes of glass beads. The intermixed content can be as much as 45, 50 percent of the of the bag of thermal plastic you have, depending on the specification that's being followed, can be 45 to 50 percent can be glass beads. These intermixed beads. What this does, the glass beads are so important because what it does is it allows the thermal plastic to renew its retroreflectivity over time. So the four primary components are pigment, resin, filler, and glass beads. Something to notice here, there's no liquid in thermal. If last week you were in our 101 course about paint, we talked a little bit about vehicle, the liquid uh, that, that's used to apply the material. Thermal plastic is 100% solids. Liquidity comes from the heating of the product. So that's how you get it to become a liquid, and when it cools, it becomes a solid again. So there is no actual liquid in the thermal plastic itself. All right, let's take a closer look at the two resins that we talked about, alkyd and hydrocarbon. Kind of the pros and cons, or the, uh, the, the comparison between the two. First of all, know that alkyd is made from wood-derived resins. So it's a renewable natural resource. We can grow more trees. It has a high resistance to cracking. Its ability to be applied directly behind the paving operations. Now you'll have different requirements by different manufacturers, but alkyd by nature, most, most of the manufacturers will allow their material to be applied directly behind the paving operations. The oils and the asphalt do not have as much of an effect as they would on hydrocarbon. It's also, alkyd is impervious to petroleum because it's not a petroleum-based product. It's best for intersections, such as your stop bars, your arrows, your merge messages, those type of things. Any of your detail work, it's, it's excellent for because those are the areas that usually cars either stop or sit on, and then that's when you have the possibility of, of petroleum dripping from that vehicle. It's also more durable overall than hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon, it's made from petroleum-derived resins. It's best used in long-line applications instead of this detail work that I was talking about earlier. If you put it in long-line applications, there's, and that means long roadways and so forth, it works well because there's no cars really stopped in those areas most of the time. It's slightly less heat-stable than ALC it is, and it's, but it's less sensitive to the changes in application properties. It's less sensitive to a little too warm, a little, or a little too hot, a little too cold, the uh, environmental conditions and so forth. So it's a little easier to work with in those cases. But the cost of the material is pretty volatile because it's, it's affected by oil prices and we all know how fluctuating the oil prices can be, especially these days. So that's the difference between alkyd and hydrocarbon. Most agencies these days are requiring alkyd just seems to have taken over the market quite a bit. In fact, in our six locations, we don't even uh, stock a hydrocarbon product. We only uh, stock the alkyd. We can get the hydrocarbon, but we only stock the alkyd. All right, let's look at some cat compatibility. When you're restriping, I always get the question of, can I stripe over this, or can I stripe over that, and so forth. And I get that with paints and thermoplastics, a lot of our products. And so this chart is great. You're actually going to receive this chart on a follow-up email, so be sure to be watching for it. I think it, it works real well for, for all these products that we're talking about. Uh, thermoplastic actually is, is very compatible with most every product except for epoxy. You can put it on waterboard paint, you can put it on solvent paint, you can put it on MMA, and you can put it on thermoplastic itself. Preformed thermoplastic or standard thermoplastic. So I get a lot of the questions, hey, can I, can I, can I put thermoplastic on this, uh, they've got painted lines already, can I put it on there? Well, yes. Is it going to stick? Yeah, it'll stick to the paint. But the question is, is the paint sticking to the asphalt? So be sure that whatever you're putting the thermoplastic on, it may be compatible with that, but make sure that what you're putting it on is actually adhered well to the surface first. And if it's not, we'll talk about that, but you'll remove that, that striping. Okay, that's materials, quick and simple. Let's go to application. Maybe a little bit uh, less simple. 
application process. Okay, so this is what happens. We take the material and we place it in a melting kettle. We liquefy it to about 400 to 440 degrees. Some materials now out there are, are able to be heated only up to like the 380 degrees. So, so look at your bag, look at your manufacturer, ask the manufacturer, what is the ideal temperature of the material when I go to apply it? And remember, we'll talk about it in a second probably, but, but the heat is not the heat really in the kettle, but what temperature is it when it hits the surface? That's what you're looking for. That's the important temperature. All right, so it's liquefied to about 440 to 400 to 440 degrees. Kettle agitator, you're putting this, this material in a, in a set of kettles, usually a white kettle and a yellow kettle. Sometimes you share a kettle, and that can be difficult, uh, changing out colors and so forth. But the, what this kettle does is it holds the material at a temperature, but it also blends those ingredients. Remember all those four ingredients? Remember, this is a granular material. Okay? They just basically take all this, these different components, put it in this mixer, mix it up, pour it in a bag, and there it is. So once you pour it in the kettle, it has to have something that continues to blend this material. Otherwise, you could have fallout. For instance, glass beads like the sink. So if you don't have the constant agitation, you could have a problem. Next, it's transferred to some type of application device. It might be a screed, a ribbon, or a spray device. It might be on the equipment uh, next to the kettles, and it might be off the equipment like we show here. This is a hand liner that is uh, being utilized, we, which is also a screed device. Now, how does the line form? Well, it's, it doesn't come out four inches uh, like a preformed product. You actually have to form it, and how it gets formed, it's shaped into spe specific width and thickness by the application machine, screed, ribbon, or spray device. And we're going to go over the details of how those devices do that in a moment. All right, let's talk about bonding. How does thermoplastic bond? Well, on asphaltic cement, or apple, there first is a mechanical bond. And this is similar, if you saw the 101, this is what paint does. It creates a mechanical bond. So the more texture the surface has, the more of a mechanical bond you're going to have. Basically, you have extensive surface area with extensive texture. So in this case, you can see that by the drawing here, the illustration, it actually bonds into the cracks and the crevices and the, the movements and texture of the surface. Thermoplastic, what makes it so great for asphalt is it actually has a thermal bond as well. It is this, this heat fusion. It actually fuses into the asphalt surface. That's why if, if thermoplastic is applied properly, when you go to try to remove it, like uh, on the edges or something like that, you try to remove it, you're going to take up a chunk of asphalt with it. And that's one of the reasons it's so effective on asphalt. Now, when you get to HCC, hydraulic concrete cement, or concrete, you, do, you still get that mechanical bond. Uh, anywhere that there's uh, any, type of, uh, any type of surface, it's going to bond mechanically uh, to that surface. This is, a, this is also uh, not just HCC, but oxidized asphalt cement, when, you're, when basically the black stuff has, has either has oxidized out or washed away, and, and really all you have is, is, is either old oxidized asphalt cement or an, an, an aggregate, uh, you're going to have the same situation. There is not going to be a thermal bond because there's nothing for it to bond to. It doesn't, it doesn't have the asphalt there, the asphalt cement to bond to. So you're relying strictly on this mechanical bond. So in that case, it is highly recommended and required by many agencies to use primers to aid in the bonding. So basically what you're doing is you're gluing the thermoplastic down to the uh, concrete. So we'll talk about it more, but when you're using thermoplastic on hydraulic concrete cement, use primers. All right, let's talk about some common equipment that's used. You heard me say something earlier about the melting, uh, melting and blending the materials uh, through uh, these, these kettles. These kettles are anywhere from 500 pound capacity to 2,500 pound capacity. I think I've seen them up to 5,000 pounds. Um, they hold the bulk material until it's ready to be applied. It heats it, blends it, and holds it. Next, you have priming equipment. Now, as I said, you're going to use a primer when you're putting on oxidized asphalt or especially on concrete. You apply the primer. This, what this does is it applies the primer 
to the pavement prior to the application. Now this can be anything from a from a very uh, technologically advanced piece of equipment down to a bug sprayer. So uh, so it depends on, on how much of this you're going to have to apply. If you're just applying a little bit on a bridge deck, then sure, use the pump-up uh, bug sprayer. You can use that just as well with a good tip on it. And just make sure you get primer evenly distributed and it's, uh, it's applied properly. Next is you have the hand liner. The hand liner is for detail work. You almost, you can't do thermoplastic without having at least one hand liner. Uh, this is used for detail work such as legends, transfer lines, that's the lines that go across the road, uh, decel or acceleration lanes where you have uh, the lines that you have to do for the decel lines, uh, decel lanes and acceleration lanes, the little six foot, uh, six foot skips, we call them 610s, uh, so a hand liner. Then there's a the glass bead dispenser. They're either a pressurized gun, which goes on more of a long line machine, or a drop-on device, which what you actually see here in this hand liner. And I think you can see my arrow. This is the bead dispenser right here. And you notice it's directly behind the application shoe, and we're going to talk more about that. But uh, it, it applies the beads onto the surface of the materials to provide retroreflectivity. Very important. Remember we had glass beads in the thermoplastic, but now we're going to put a top coat of glass beads on the thermoplastic. All right, equipment methods. Extrusion, uh, ribbon, and spray applications. I'm going to go through all three of these applications. First, let's get with extrusion. This is a rough drawing of basically what it looks like when you're applying through extrusion. The material comes down into the shoe, the shoe, the die, the screed, call it all kinds of things. I, uh, from my experience, I have always called them a die. So it goes into the die. This is usually an open top die. I see this line here, but it's usually an open top die. And the material comes in, flows in, and then this die, actually here, let's, uh, let's get, get caught up here. Material is dispensed into the die. The screed opens and is pushed across the pavement. Basically, when, when, there's, when it's pressed onto the ground, when you release that handle of that hand liner or in, in the truck, because there are uh, truck mount uh, extrusion devices, but once it hits, it opens this trap door and it's pushed across the pavement. Now, understand something important is that this must maintain continuous contact because it controls what, how that extrusion comes out Let's say it's a four-inch die. It'll be four-inch wide, and that controls the width of that line. If that if that comes off the surface, guess what? You're going to have you're going the line's going to overflow. Next is the material flows out, forming a line, and the die controls the width and the thickness of the line. No pressure is used in this. This is all gravity application. Okay. Next, let's talk about ribbon application. I'm going to go back to, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back here just real quick again. The material goes into the die. The die opens when it presses against the ground. It's scraped across the pavement surface, and the material comes out, and the die controls the thickness and the width of the line. And again, no pressure is used. All right, now let's go back. Ribbon application. All right, in ribbon application, the material is dispensed into a heated, pressurized gun, heated, pressurized gun. The gun is suspended above the surface. Remember, there's the die had continuous contact. The gun for a ribbon applicator does not touch the surface. The material is forced out through this little slit, this opening. And the specific thickness and width is controlled by that slit. This creates a ribbon, and that's why we call it ribbon gun, is because it creates this ribbon it basically lays across the pavement and bonds. So this material is is the is kind of preformed when it comes out of that ribbon gun. So let's say it's preformed to 90 mils, and then it just lays that ribbon of 90 mils of thermoplastic over top of the surface. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, now we get into spray systems. A spray application. The material is dispensed into a high-pressure gun. High-pressure gun, <laughs> remember that one? The gun is suspended above the surface. Again, it does not have contact with the surface. There's an 
atomization that takes place, uh, atomized material is, is forced out of the material into a spray pattern, and then it's sprayed um, materials, it's sprayed material bond to pavement. Okay. The material that is sprayed bonds to the pavement. It builds up to form a line. So obviously the slower you go, the thicker the line. The faster you go, the thinner the line. Just like if you're adding, just like you're striking with, with traffic paint. The width is controlled by the opening of the gun and the speed of the vehicle. Very important. I will I'll stop here for just a moment. I was in a, um, I do these things live as well, and I was in this one city, and I won't name it. You may be out there. <laughs> I said this one city, and they said, hey, what happens, what, what causes thermoplastic to turn into a powder? I said, well, you mean like during manufacturing? They said, no, 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 after you apply it. I'm, I don't know. I had never heard of anything like that. I said, I said you're going to have to show me for me to understand. So after the, after the meeting, after the conference, after the presentation, uh, they took me for a ride, and we went out and we looked at this, uh, looked at this, this, these lines on the street, and all the darn, there was like piles of powder of thermoplastic in different areas. And, and I noticed that they were, they were, there were chunks of, as, of not asphalt, but chunks of, um, of thermoplastic laying around as well. What it was was that the material was applied so thick that its cohesion, thermoplastic is not really made to apply beyond 125 mils at most thermoplastics. Uh, so uh, when you apply them at 390 mils, by <laughs> a spray applicator, which is what, what this was, 390 mils. Uh, what happens, it breaks apart, and when it get, gets broken apart, and you hit, hit it with a tire a couple thousand times an hour, uh, eventually this will turn back to powder. So that's what it was. So just if your thermoplastic turned to powder, you might want to take a look and make sure you're not putting down 390 mils. Uh, that line is either going to last forever or be gone in days. All right, so that's spray application. Equipment method comparison. So extrusion application. What's the advantages of using an extrusion application? Well, the line thickness and width control. What you have is, is as you notice, I, I talked about that uh, that on a ribbon, it's it's basically kind of like a preformed ribbon coming out. So if it's at 90 mils and your requirement is 90 mils above surface, and you have a uh, a, a highly textured surface like a, um, a friction course or something of that sort. You, you could have an issue because it won't be 90 mils above because it's going to sink down into those in, into the texture and the pores of that surface. But with a dye, when you do it, it's going to fill up those surfaces and come up to 90 mils. So you have better, better thickness and width controls. It's good for thicker markings. Uh, you, again, you don't have to, um, it, it just helps you manage thicker markings more when you have to go to 120 mils for some reason, like for instance, rumble strips and so forth. Hand operation. Uh, the advantage is that you can hand operate it. Uh, you can do detail work with it. It's not pressurized. And again, back to the line thickness and width. Remember the line thickness and width also what that means is that you have a die on it. And that die is four has a gap that's four inches by 90 mils, four inches by 120 mils, whatever it is. So that's where you get your control. It's very it's, it's set. It's steel. It's kind of hard to get beyond that. But it also, again, back to the above the surface thickness. Disadvantages? Well, it's, it's the slowest form of application. Uneven surfaces can be a problem. Why? Remember I told you that that dye goes across that surface and it uh, maintains contact. Now let's talk about ribbon application. Advantages? It's faster application. Line thickness and width is controlled on smooth surfaces. Remember, it comes out kind of preformed at 90 mils, 120 mils, whatever that is. Uh, it works well on uneven surfaces because it's just going to lay on top of that. So you don't have to worry about having that constant contact. Disadvantages, Ooh, pressurized material. Pressurized molten plastic at 400 degrees. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't tell you how important it is to remember the dangers of pressurized molten material at 400 degrees. We'll talk about that in a moment, of what to do when something happens. Uh, above the surface thickness, uh, it doesn't give you a good, as I said about uh, in comparison to the extrusion die, you're, you can have um, where the material lays into the, the texture of the surface. And it has to be truck or trailer mounted. 
it's affected also by ambient wind temperatures because now you have an air gap between the material, the application device, and the surface. You have, again, you have a, an air gap between the application device and the surface, which you don't have on an extrusion application. All right, advantages of spray application is the fastest application. You do have better bonding. The reason you have uh, have better bonding is because what you're doing is is you're you're kind of the way that's coming down. You're actually kind of applying a primer, or, you know, and, and it's building up from that. So so most things have better affinity to themselves than whatever you're attaching them to. So as long as you don't go to 390 mils. Um, the material is going to, uh, going to usually bond better. It will get in every single crevice because it's very liquidy. Liquidy. I have to look that one up and make sure that's a word. Pressurized material dangers. Uh, yes, absolutely. Same situation that you have with ribbon application. It's got to be truck or trailer mounted. And it is also affected by ambient and wind temperatures. And it does have thickness limitations. OK. All right. Let's wake you guys up and let's do a quick audience poll. Which application method, and just about everybody is going to have to answer this one because you all seem to apply thermoplastic in one form or another. Which one do you use most? Do you use extrusion, ribbon, spray, or you're not currently using thermoplastic, which you know, we know there's not too many of those out there, and, uh, or you don't know. I don't know. My contractor does it. I'm not sure how he's using it or how he's applying it. I think you'll answer that though. Help us move forward. And I'm going to take a drink while you do that. Of water, of course. All right. Waiting on just a couple more votes. All right. Looks like we have 47% are using extrusion, 12% are using ribbon, 24% are using spray. And another 18% aren't sure. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for participating in that. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that the majority is using extrusion. Uh, that's usually the case because that's usually how you start out for sure is because you, you have to have extrusion at some point uh, because you have to do detail work. Then you have, uh, of course, ribbon and spray. Uh, spray is, is actually more popular in different regions than others. So, so that you'll find, uh, for instance, Texas is a... Uh, is, is very much into the spray application. Because of its speed of application, it tends to be a little safer when you're doing long line work. All right, so we'll move on. Thank you for participating. All right, now we're going to talk about surface preparation. Ensure that uh, your surface is free of dirt, dust, and debris, and other contaminants. All right, first thing you got to do is, remember I told you earlier that the material is going to stick well to whatever you stick it to. But if that is not sticking well to the surface, then you're in trouble. And that includes dirt and dust, uh, especially if you're talking about concrete, because concrete has that real fine dust. So you want to make sure all that is up. If you have some poorly adhered markings, you need to go in and you've got to get rid of them. You've got to pull them up. Now, the best way to put there's two primary methods of removing uh, pavement markings, just real quickly. One is by hydroblasting, and one is through, uh, through grinding or eradicating. Uh, we highly recommend, uh, of course, if, you, if you've got a, you know, a, a million dollar uh, water blaster out there, then, then use it. Uh, by all means, use it. But, uh, but mostly, uh, we recommend the grinding. Grinding is great. Now, when you do this, uh, we highly recommend, you see a grinder here. This is, this is not a standard drum grinder. Um, this, this device is a rotary grinder. And what it does is it, it goes, it, it's, instead of vertical, cutting, it does horizontal cutting. And when it does that, it creates this nice feathered edge so you don't have this mill mark down the line when you're, when you're removing it because those mill marks cause what we call ghost lines. So because there's a texture difference, they actually reflect light and, and it looks like a line sometimes. So very important that you use a device that's going to keep those edges feathered and not look like a, a, a line down the road. So I highly recommend this particular device. The one we sell is, is by Smith. Absolutely best manufacturer of grinders. Next, you're going to, so you, you made sure there's no dirt and debris. You removed your markings. Now, right before application, you need to make sure that there's no moisture present. Because if there's moisture present, you will not have proper adhesion 
of the linemen. We're going to talk more about those and, and troubleshoot and find that. So you want to check if there's moisture. This is a quick test, very easy. You can go out and buy a, a couple hundred dollar uh, moisture meter. I recommend those. But this is very quick, very easy. You usually have these products on your truck without a problem. So you, you're going to tape a square, about a, about a 12 inch square of plastic onto the surface. And you're, it's called, we call it a sweat test sometimes. And you're going to let it, you got to do this in the sunlight. Do this in the sunlight, give it 20 minutes, pull it up. And if you pull it up and it has little droplets, uh, you, you're probably going to have droplets on, on the, the plastic because you're going to be pulling some kind of moisture. But basically, if they're larger, the kind of rule of thumb is if they're larger than the head of, or of the eraser on a pencil, then again, the larger than the eraser head of the pencil, then, uh, then you need to wait. You need to hold off. Next, you're going to make sure that the temperature is right. Understand that temperature, you have ambient and you have surface. Sometimes the ambient temperature is cooler than the surface. Sometimes the ambient temperature is hotter than the surface. You need to make sure they're both 50 degrees and rising. Also check with your manufacturer, probably written on the bag of, of application temperatures, but generally 50 degrees and rising is what can be used. You're going to apply the primer as needed. And here you go. Apply the primer, if applicable, to re preheat the material at 400 to 440 degrees. Apply the material to the thickness and width specified. Immediately apply glass beads at the appropriate rate. Remember, the embedment of these beads are depending on the, on the liquidity of the material. The, the viscosity of that material is going to allow the, those beads to sink into that 55, 60 percent, which we'll talk in a moment about. So you need to get those, those glass beads on immediately. We, I just heard a tale uh, two days ago uh, about an agency that was put the thermal plastic down and a couple minutes later came through and threw some beads on it. Well, that's just not going to work because that material is already set up. You need to protect the line until it's solidified. That's usually one to two minutes, depending on the outside temperature your ambient and your surface temperature. Because remember, you're waiting for it to cool down to solidify. We can't do a, a report or a webinar on thermal plastic without mentioning preformed thermal plastic. I'd like to tell you about the pros and cons of preformed thermal plastic. We sell preformed thermal plastic. We have for many years. Uh, I've used preformed thermal plastic. Uh, so let's talk about it. The pros is that there's low startup costs. There's really uh, to buy the equipment and so forth. It, it, it's very inexpensive to get into. But don't go cheap because you also have to know that you really need to make sure you get a very good high pressure, um, uh, uh, sorry, torch. Uh, there you go. A high pressure torch. Just a standard weed burner is not good enough. You're not going to get proper heating. Uh, different manufacturers make different types. Uh, we sell one that's that's a kind of an uh, it's, it's better. It's a high pressure torch, but yet it's, it's an economic version. Economical version. There are some that are about a thousand dollars, which are really cool. I'm glad to sell you one of those, but uh, but definitely need to make sure that you get a good torch. And it's, but it is low startup cost. Uh, color change is really easy. You get get out another roll. Uh, low skill requirement. You know, if you can if you can squat, bend over, roll this thing out, and use a torch. Of course, you know, using a torch can be a little tricky itself without burning yourself, but. Uh, but definitely, uh, it's low skill requirement, less ambient temperature constraints. I will warn you on this. A lot of times, <clears throat> the great thing about preformed thermal is you can heat the surface and then heat the material if you've got some borderline temperatures, so you can apply it under uh, cooler temperatures. But uh, the thing you have to remember is that thermal plastic likes to become more rigid when it gets cooler. So definitely keep your thermal plastic, your preformed thermal plastic rolls inside of the cab of your truck in the heat. If you're anywhere, I would say 55 degrees or under, don't put them in the back of the truck. If it gets down to you know 35 degrees or something, you're, you pull it out and it's just going to fracture all over you. So just be careful with that. Fast single application, very simple. If you're only doing like one stop bar, one arrow, that type of thing. The cons. Danger with working with direct fire. Now you got a guy handling this torch. Handling this torch. Uh, high labor factor. It takes a while. It's it's a lot. It takes a lot more time than running through it with a handliner. I will tell you though, setup is much less on preform than on extrusion, for example. But once you get rolling, 
uh, extrusion is much faster than application of preformed thermoplastic. Material temperature sensitivity, you got to make sure you bake that material in there. I suggest, and if there's any of you manufacturers out there, please excuse me, burn it before you underheat it. Uh, you know, I've seen the majority of the application problems with preformed thermoplastic is due to the fact that they did not heat the material up enough. Higher material cost, substantially higher material cost over an extrusion material, over extrusion material. All right, so that's the pros and cons of preformed thermoplastic. Hope that's a help. All right, now I've got a list of do's and don'ts here, and there's uh, I believe there's 30 do's and don'ts. I'm not going to go through them all, and I want you to know that this these do's and don'ts are listed in our thermo guides. If you'd like a copy of our thermo guide, it's a booklet uh, that has a lot of this information in it. And it has the do's and don'ts in the back. Please let us know. Uh, Lynn will tell you how to let us know that, and we'll be glad to get one to you. But I want to go over some important ones. One is do not apply thermoplastic on the shoulder or travel lane joints. You don't want to put it on the joints because the joints move. You want to be beside those joints, usually a few inches from them. Do not mix alkyl and hydrocarbon thermoplastic in application equipment. If you go from one to the other, make sure that you clean that, that device out uh, very well. We sell a product called CitraPro, which is absolutely incredible for uh, dissolving uh, thermoplastic and cleaning equipment. Uh, so if you have any questions on that, you can get with us. Then there's the pavement surface. You want to make sure that you do ensure that the pavement is clean, dust-free, and dry. It's only going to stick to whatever you stick it to. Do ensure that the surface temperatures are at 50 degrees and rising. And remember, surface temperatures can vary from the ambient. Do ensure that the air temperature is 50 degrees and rising. Consider the wind chill factors, especially if you're doing ribbon or spray, because remember that temperature is what the temperature is of the material when it hits that surface. That's the temperature that you're looking for. So 65 degrees or less, you could, within a wind chill factor, that could cause that application to go awry. Do ensure that usage of primer that is approved by the thermoplastic manufacturer. I have people tell me, hey, I, I can get some primer over at Home Depot or, or um, uh, at Lowe's or whatever it might be. Can I just go get that? Well, yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? Is it the same? Maybe. But the problem is, is that if you have a problem and you go back to that thermoplastic manufacturer and you say, hey, I've got it on concrete. It came up. And they said, did you apply primer? Yes. Well, I don't see that you bought any primer. They're going to say, hey, you're, you've got to use the approved primer of the manufacturer. So very important. All right. Uh, do ensure that the glass beads are properly applied immediately after thermoplastic, as I sp spoke to earlier. And make sure that the beads anchor at about 55 to 60 percent embedment. And we'll talk about that more in reflectivity. Do not hold the material above 450 degrees, more than four hours. Total heating time should not exceed six hours. So if you're just holding the material at 450 degrees and you're just sitting there, you're going you're gonna to end up breaking down the material. So you want to be careful with that. And then, oh, yep, there's a couple more here. I want to go, oh, do not exceed 125 mils thickness in one application. We don't recommend this because in our experience, when you do, you're going to have fracturing of the material. And, okay, do use cold or iced water to treat skin in contact with high, hot thermoplastic. Every thermoplastic applicator should have a cooler with ice cold water on it anyway, but that's for two purposes. One is to keep your guys hydrated, and two, if you do have an accident, you can stick your limb in there uh, and, and, and get it cooled down or at least uh, put something in there to, to, to get it onto your limb. It's very important that you have iced water on site to treat any contact with thermoplastic. Do not attempt to remove the thermoplastic from your skin. Uh, trust me, don't do it. It's going to take your skin with you. Go get medical attention. All right, next we're going to talk about thermoplastic inspection. All right, let's do another quick poll. This is for government agencies. Got just a moment. Uh, da, da, da. There you go. Uh, what is, I had to get something out of the way there. Uh, what is the current mix of in-house versus contractor outsourced thermoplastic markings. 
This is, um, this is for, of course, the government agencies. What we'd like to know is how many of you are actually doing in-house application versus how many of you are contracting it out and what percentage. If I could have you uh, participate in the poll, I'd really appreciate it. And I'll give you a minute to do so, and Lynn will tell us about the results. Give me just another moment to get some more votes in. And I think we got everyone we're going to be getting. So we have 36% are doing it all in-house. 9% are doing the majority in-house. We have 36% are contracting the majority out and 18% are contract contracting all of it out. Oh, very good. Well, we're going to get into inspection, I believe, next year. So, so this is really good because not only do you need to understand how to inspect if you're applying it yourself, but you certainly need to know how to inspect it if your contractor is applying it. There are contractors uh, with varying degrees of experience and expertise in this, so it's always good to be able to go behind them and, and help them, not, not just criticize them when they do something wrong, but help them when they do something wrong to know what it is. Uh, knowledge is great. So let's go to our general plastic inspection. So one of the first things you're going to look at when you're inspecting thermal is you're going to make sure that it's the right color. Is it, is, it yellow? is it the yellow you're looking for? Is it the white you're looking for? Now that's done through a couple different ways. Uh, one may be just a visual. Oh, it looks good. Uh, another way is that if you get more technical, uh, you might have a, uh, a sample sheet of color. And those sample sheets, I think you get them from the feds for, for, on yellow uh, for like $65. It's a piece of cardboard with paint on it, uh, strangely enough. But those work good. But of course, the most accurate way is with a spectral photometer. And that's what you see here. This is the spectral photometer. You can put it right on the marking, check the color, and make sure it's within what they call the specified color box. So it's the right color. Now you're going to go and you're going to say, okay, what about it? Is it really as thick as it should be? Let me tell you. It, for government agencies, this is where you can get cheated. So be careful. Make sure that you're getting the thickness. Um, how do you get that? Well, you're going to use one of two devices. <coughs> the old device that we always used uh, was a micrometer that looked like this. We would take um, take the thermal plastic or take take a duct tape, and usually they use the same color as pavement. You can understand why that would be. And they would put it in the path of the striper. The striper would go over it. They they let it cool. They pull that duct tape up, and then they peel that duct tape back. And they use a micrometer and they see what the thickness is. A great way to do it. But recently, over the last couple of years, they developed these devices, and these are great. Uh, we do supply these as well. But they actually check the the thickness of the outside of the lines and the inside of the, in the center of the line. And this is basically, uh, I think this is for a six inch line. Uh, and it works very well for lane lines. A little more difficult to work with them on, on other types of wider lines. But these are great. They'll tell you the thickness of, of the line. I was in Ecuador recently and and they were using a high build paint supposedly. And if you know what high build paint is, it goes down normally at about 25 mils. Well, we measured the, the thickness of this, this paint, and it was being put down, or it was drying at about 7 mils. So they weren't high building the high build paint, but this meter was really good for detecting that. So you, you check the thickness, it meets the thickness. Uh, by the way, uh, 90 mils is nearly the thickness of a nickel. A nickel's a little thicker than, than 90 mils. Uh, we used to joke about people throwing nickels down inspectors. So they throw a nickel. what we meant by that is, a, as a contractor, is they take a nickel and they they set it beside that line. And if it was too much further under the the thickness of that nickel, they knew that something was wrong. So that's that's one measurement you can use. But remember, a nickel is actually a little thicker than 90 mils. And 90 mils used to be the standard. Uh, it, it's changed a little bit. And sometimes they want to put more on center lines than on edge lines and so forth. Width of lines. Of course, you want to make sure that the width is correct. If the material, aside from spraying, if it's ribbon or if it's extrude, that width is probably going to be pretty darn accurate unless they use the wrong shoe or the wrong head on the, on the ribbon gun. So, but on spray, it can vary considerably. 
So be sure to check the width. That's easily done with a, a standard, uh, we use a steel flat ruler to check the width. Oh, one other thing on width. Understand that when there's temporary striping being done, and if you're checking the width of that temporary striping, if it's supposed to be a six inch line, it's five and a half, I, I suggest that you give the, the contractor a break. What he's trying to do, what he should be trying to do, is make sure that he can adequately cover that line. So, um, so just keep that in mind. Next is bead embedment. You want to make sure that the majority of the beads are embedded 55 to 60 percent, and you can use a magnifying glass to do that. You get them literally on your hands and knees, put that magnifying glass in there, and you can see if it's 55 to 60 percent. I'm going to tell you why that's important in a few minutes. Second to last is you're going to check the adhesion and cohesion. This is what I was talking about earlier, that if you, if you try to pull up a, a thermal plastic, it should bring part, if, if you're doing a course on, on good asphalt, it should bring part of that asphalt up. You can take that, that uh, knife and you can go under the edge, pick up the little corner of it, and see, and there should be black asphalt, of course, attached to the thermal plastic when you pull it up. It's likely you can pull it up because the asphalt is tender and, and it doesn't have a whole lot of tensile strength. So it should come up, but it should, if it comes up, it'll bring asphalt with it, especially if it's newer asphalt. And of course, does the retroreflectivity uh, fall within the specifications of your city, county, state, whatever it is, uh, requirement that you're doing? At this time, there are no uh, federal standards for retroreflectivity with regards to pavement markings. Those are coming around the corner. They've been swearing that they're going to have them every year for the last several years. Uh, this is really, really important that you do have proper retroreflectivity because if the stripes do not have retroreflectivity, you don't see them at night. Oh, and by the way, the devices used for that is, are usually retroreflectometers. They run anywhere from 17,000 to 20,000, 20, well, to 20 to 25,000. So uh, depending on what you buy, what model, and what brand. And note that we do rent uh, Stripe Master, uh, the Stripe Master 2s, which is one of the devices. Troubleshooting thermoplastic. Okay, so you just kind of went through. You checked the appearance, you checked the thickness, the width, the beads, embedment, the adhesion, and the, and the retroreflectivity. Now, you're looking at the line, and the line looks like this. It's nice and smooth, not jagged, nice and flat, looks good on the edges, on the top, and so forth. That's a proper application. It means that, you know, it has sharp edges. The color is right, the width is right, the thickness, the bonding, everything works out right. But that's not always what it looks like. Sometimes you get this. And this is what no adhesion, like a, a, a bulge at the start. Well, that's usually caused, let's see if we've got here, okay. That's usually caused by the material temperature being too low. Uh, when you don't have bonding to the surface, either the material temperature is too low, you could have the road could be too gritty, uh, the marking speed may be, may be too fast, or the road too cold. I see it mo mostly a temperature aspect. I, I don't think that out there in the field a lot of times that we pay enough attention to the surface ambient temperatures and adjust accordingly uh, the material temperature. So a lot of times the road's too cold and the material's too co cold. Next is you have bubbles in line. Just experienced this this morning, driving on my way to work. Of course I pull over, I'm looking at the striping and, and I don't know. We, we get a little fanatical as we as we learn more about things. We we uh, we begin uh, in pavement markings. We end up in the middle of a street taking pictures. And I found this, and I and I'm sorry I didn't load it for this this presentation. But these bubbles are usually caused, and this this material had these bubbles all over it, and it was actually breaking loose from the surface because there were so many bubbles. There was there was not good adhesion, but that's because there was moisture or solvent that tra that was trapped in the line. Or, or it could be that the material was overheated. Understand that, that if there's moisture on the surface, you put a hot material on, on, a, on, a, moisture, um, on a surface with moisture, what's going to happen? It's going to actually steam up that water, and that water creates a barrier between the material and the surface. So very important to make sure that there's no moisture present. Uh, roughened pitted, ed, uh, pitted lines. That's normally when you see that, the most common thing is that there's a foreign object either in the line or caught in the dye. It could be from overheating as well, because that means that there's crust forming in the material and it's getting out and it's clogging up the dye or the gum. Next is crumbly edges or line gaps. Material usually is too cold. Uh, you'll see, I think, in a moment, this is what we call it stretching sometimes. 
it's you're you're trying to extrude this material or spray this material, and it's just too thick and and too cold, and it, and it's stretching, so therefore it's leaving these gaps. Swollen lines, skewed, rounded start. Um, this is usually because the material's too hot. It's actually flowing on you. Uh, it can be. I saw this in that same place that we had 390 mils where they did the handwork, and I saw this. It wasn't necessarily in this case because the material was too hot. Uh, it was because of this next question, or next thing here, it was because of strong road camber. The road had, the surface had so many undulations that if the die did not have constant contact with the surface, so the material would flow out from underneath that die bar. Cracks in the line. Um, pavement may be cracked. I understand that doesn't affect the durability of the thermoplastic. It could be that uh, the temperatures were too cold, either the, of the material or or the temperature of the surface. Temperature stress from overheating can cause that, or it was applied too thin. There's not enough material there to create that cohesive uh, bond that you need of the material. But also understand that over time, alkyd thermoplastic is well known for these types of of, uh, of cracks. These these cracks that go across. Now these cracks that come in an angle. That's usually calls from different other things or from other reasons, like I've just mentioned. But you will have over time alkyd thermoplastic does crack like this. As a matter of fact, again, I took pictures this morning. Uh, I promise the next one, if you have your guys come back on, I'll uh, I'll make sure I get some of those pictures in there. Uh, crumbly edges, rough surface, uh, material temperatures too low, uh, overheated or scorched material, and you'll also notice this usually in coloration differences. And I think I go over that in a moment, but you'll see a a greener yellow and a beige or white, uh, usually with this when it's overheated or scorched material. Jagged edges um, uh, and drops within the gap. I saw this again this morning. This is mainly because your die is, or, or even your gun is not turning off properly, or die is not closing properly, or there may be foreign objects in those, and it's just not it's not snapping off. Uh, you could also have a uh, in in a uh, hand liner. You could have a bad die spray. Uh, which again, dies not closing properly, and that's what causes it. Shadows along the, the edges of the lines. This is usually because of uh, heavy undulation of the surface, or the die is just not writing completely straight on the sub uh, on the on the um, on the surface. So you have uh, the material flowing out from the side, but the die is still making its little nice little mark down it. In spray applications. Um, this is uh, if you have excessive spray over spray, you're going to have uh, too much atomization pressure. Uh, air may be leaking through the blowback spray uh, spray line. Uh, hesitation at start or finish. Moisture could be in the line, or the material may be too hot, or even the material be too cold. But a lot of application issues can be it can be because of that temperature range again of hot or cold. Again, most application issues that I see are temperature related to the materials. I don't. Uh, again, I think it's something that we really need to focus more on: is are we applying the material at the right temperature? Lumps in the line, material is too cold, it's coming out in globs. Oops. Uh, so, whoop, let's try that again. So, uh, lumps in the line, if you see pieces of thermoplastic, just, it's, just not, it's just not being heated enough. So, here you go. That's, uh, that's the uh, troubleshooting of thermoplastic spray application. And I hope this is helpful. In our thermoplastic guide, we have every one of these illustrations, and you can go through them and uh, through that book and have it. It's actually the size that would fit in your glove box, which is really nice uh, that you can troubleshoot from that, from that uh, book. All right, now we're into retroflectivity basics. I know I'm at uh, just over one hour, so I'm going to try to speed through this, but also give it the proper time it needs. Uh, retroflectivity. There's basically three types of retroflectivity. One is called mirror reflection. Basically, the light reflects in the same angle in the opposite direction. Now, understand that this is this is what they call the uh, you know the law of reflectivity. Always light when light hits an object, it reflects in the opposite direction by the same angle in which it hit. Then you have diffusion retroreflectivity, or I'm sorry, diffusion reflectivity, and it reflects in many different directions. It hits an object and bounces and scatters many different ways. Now wait a minute, I just said that when light hits something, there's a law here that says it, it hits it and then it bounces in the opposite direction by the same angle. Well, diffusion is created because of a textured surface, and it's doing just that. 
except it's like little mini pieces of light are hitting the different uh, surfaces and reflecting in the opposite direction by the same angle. Retroreflection is when light hits a surface and reflects back to the source. And it uses mirror reflection, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, how it does. Also note that in diffusion, you do have some retro reflectivity here. Uh, it's, it's from the scattered light, and it will, you will be able to see the color at night. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Oil-borne paints are usually a, um, a very smooth texture. They're, they're grinding to smaller. They create almost a glossy look. If you have a yellow line and you're driving down the road and there's no glass beads on this yellow paint, uh, it's, and, and you shine your lights on it at night, you're going to get mostly a gray shadow line. There's no color being reflected back. Now, if that's waterborne, which has a larger grind uh, type, uh, basically the pieces of it are, are larger, a lot of times you'll get a little bit of retroreflectivity because it's a rougher textured surface. So that's how diffusion works, and that's how you get a little bit of reflectivity, even maybe without some glass beads. All right, so we know what types of, retro, of reflectivity there are. Let's talk about retro. Retro what? Oh, retro re reflectivity. Trust me, your word processors, none of them are going to pick up this word. They always say I'm spelling it wrong, and, and sometimes I am, which is really uh, difficult to, <laughs> to catch. But let's talk about it. Basically, retroreflectivity is the ability of an object, like a stop sign, to redirect the light back to its source, as I said earlier, uh, which could be the car's headlights or the car itself. So again, retroreflectivity is the ability of an object to reflect the light back to the source. All right. Why is it so important? Why is retroreflectivity so important? Well, in the daytime, we have a ton of cues. You know, we've got, we can see the trees, we can see the movement of the road, we see other cars coming, you know, everything, you see the guardrail going. You have all these cues, these visible cues, and it makes our driving, our task of driving relatively easy. But at nighttime, those visual cues, they go away. So all you have is darkness. With ex aside from maybe light from the stars or from the moon or you know, some type of ambient light that's, that's being created. So the task is much more difficult. This is where you find that retroreflectivity is absolutely necessary. You have to have retroreflectivity provide gui to provide guidance at night. Retroreflectivity provides nighttime guidance. That's why it's so important. If you can't see it, if it doesn't reflect, you're not going to see it. If you can't see it, it can't guide you or warn you. Okay, so what are the sources that provide retroreflectivity? There are two primary sources that give you retroreflectivity, and both use that law that I was talking about a moment ago that reflect light in the opposite direction by the what? The same angle. Okay, so the first one is prismatics, and light on prisma, uh, microprismatics is what we call them. It's usually used in sign sheeting and some materials and so forth, and we'll We'll talk about that in a moment. It reflects basically off of three mirrored surfaces. The light comes in, hits the surface, hits another part of the surface, hits another part of the surface, and it's redirected back to the source. Now, this is very efficient. This is a, that's why you find microprismatic materials um, so bright, is because they can engineer these things to send the light anywhere they want, pretty much, and, and that's what they do. They engineer these prisms to return that light. And that's how you get retroreflectivity through the microprisms. Now glass beads are a little different. The light comes in. Let's see here. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to decide if I want how detailed I want to go here because I got an, I got another slide coming up here. The light on embedded glass beads bends, reflects, and then bends again and and um, and comes back to the source. Now let's talk about it more specifically here. All right, so here you go. You got the pavement surface. You have the binding material, which is thermoplastic paint, whatever it might be. And then you have your glass bead. And glass bead is at about 60% embedment. Anywhere between 55 and 60, remember, that's where you want to be. Okay, so here comes the light. The light comes from the source. That's a headlight. Okay. Now, when light hits water and when light hits glass, what happens to that light? That light bends. Anytime you, you enter light into, that's why when you put a pencil in a glass of water, you can look at it, and, and it looks like that pencil just, just bent. Well, that's because of the light refraction. 
and when we say bend, we're talking about refraction. So it bends that light, and it bends it down to the back of that, that bead. Now it hits the back of that bead, and it picks up the binder's color with it. And it takes that color and reflects it back to the edge of the bead. Well, what happens when it gets to the edge of the bead and goes through it? Well, remember what it does is it bends. It bends again. And fortunately, you can see it's bending back to the source of the light. That's how you get retro reflectivity from a glass bead. Pop quiz. Retro reflectivity devices on our roadways. OK, we have this little roadway up here. What uses retro reflectivity? Well, first of all, the sign sheeting on the signs. They depend on retro reflectivity. And it's normally, uh, these days, uh, mostly prisms, but there's still glass beads being used in, in some of the materials. So you have glass beads and prisms and sign sheeting. What's the next thing? See some raised pavement markers. Now, raised pavement markers, what do they use? They use prisms. Now, I will say in Europe and in some places in uh, South and Central America, you'll find uh, some, some products, some, some uh, reflective pavement markers that use some very durable uh, glass beads. But they're not the glass beads you're used to seeing. They're actually much larger. They're almost like mini marbles. And, and those, are, those are set into the reflective pavement marker. So not just prisms as listed here. You do have glass beads as well being used now. Actually been used for quite a while. Just not in the U.S. much. Safety equipment. All your safety equipment usually has some type of reflective uh, material on it. And it's usually either it's a sheeting, so you're going to have prisms and glass beads. And then, of course, your pavement markings themselves. And what does pavement markings use? We haven't figured out yet how to put microprismatic uh, material on uh, in your thermoplastics. So right now it's using glass beads. And also, notice the taillights there. Don't forget, taillights use, uh, portions of the taillight actually have reflective uh, characteristics as well, and those are using prisms. Okay, so that's the basics of, of retroreflectivity. Now let's talk about its measurement. Now, we're going to get a little technical here, but I'm going to break it down for us so that I can even understand it. 30 meter geometry. What is 30 meter geometry? Simply stated, it's the amount of light sent out 30 meters from the light source compared to the amount of light sent back. Okay, So it's a measurement of the reflectivity of light from a 30 meter distance. Now you've probably heard, if you've been involved in this at all, you've probably heard 15 meter geometry, 30 meter. We used to be at 15, geometry, 15 meter geometry. Most countries have went to 30 meter geometry. Now why? What's the difference? Well, basically what they've discovered is that 30 meters is more uh, reflective, <laughs> uh, interesting word, choice of words, more reflective of what the actual driver is looking out. They're not looking out 15 meters, they're looking out 30 meters. So that's why we're basing all our measurements on 30 meters now. <clears throat> there are three angles that we look at in retroreflectivity. One is called the entrance angle. What is the angle in which the light is hitting the device? And then we look at the viewing angle. What is the angle that, that comes back, what is the angle that the person viewing it, what are they looking at it at? And then, of course, the difference between the two is called the observation angle. Now, knowing that is not as important as knowing what the 30 meters mean. But let's go and talk about measuring reflectivity and, and the components that are used for that. All right. We've all, if we've been in retroreflectivity, we've all heard of the word candela. What, is a, what exactly is a candela? Well, maybe oversimplified, uh, but the best way to describe it is the light of a candle from one foot away. So if something is one candela, it's equivalent to a light of the candle from one foot away. A millicandela, well, we all had uh, math and metric system in school probably, so you can guess that a millicandela is a thousand of a candela. It's measured by, again, remembering uh, measuring retroreflectivity is measured by how much light is sent compared to how much light is returned or how much light is returned compared to how much light is sent. It's comparing those two. So if you have uh, 100 units sent and you get 50 back, it's the same thing as if you sent 50 and you got 25 back. Why that's important to know is that various light sources can be used in retroreflectometers. Uh, and, and 
those light sources can kind of go across the board. It doesn't matter what type of light system you have on your car. It's still that that uh, that measurement is still the same. Whether it's incandescent, halogen, xenon, LED, all these uh, light sources will measure out uh, basically the same. Uh, again, it's just a comparison of how much light it sent and how much light it got back. So note that 250 millicandela is incorrect. If you talk to anybody that's very that's technical engineers, uh, physicists, and so forth, our products are not, let's say, 250 millicandelas. And please forgive my little Skype thing that keeps popping up. I unfortunately did not turn that off. Uh, um, Note that um, when you when you have 250, you can't say that the stripe is 250 millicandelas. It's 250 millicandelas per meter squared per lux. 250 millicandelas meter squared per lux. So basically, it's saying, hey, every lux that's a unit of light, I send that, I get 250 millicandela back at 30 meters. So uh, that's what that means. Uh, so if you see the technical terms, you'll see that if you're reading a spec, it'll be much longer than just 250 millicandelas if it's done right. Tec technically, if I just said 250 millicandela, it means that the product or whatever it is, it illuminates independently. It's not a reflection. There you go. That's what it'll look like on your spec sheet. All right. Types of retroflectivity equipment. Okay, so that was that was our, our our math part, our difficult part, knowing what a candela is, what a millicandela is, how it's measured, and what the technical terms is. All right, All right now let's talk about uh, types of retroflectivity equipment. You have handheld uh, for signs, uh, like the 922 Road Vista instrument, uh, the portable uh, units for pavement markings. This is the uh, Road Vista Stripe Master 2, uh, both units of which we sell and uh, sell, train, on, uh, and also rent. Then you have the mobile retroreflectometers. You may have seen these on the road. Uh, they're, they're gaining more popularity because of the safety fa factor. Uh, they're, it's kind of like a long line striping machine in a sense. So you have, uh, this, is, this is the Laser Lux Road Vista. And then you have what's called a goniometer. Goniometer, funny name for a lab instrument that basically uh, measures the retroreflectivity of most anything that you put on it in different angles, whatever angle you, you register in the computer. So this is what they use in the lab. For example, if, uh, if a product is made, uh, you know, like a, a reflective pavement marker, they'll put it on a goniometer to see what the real reflective value is. Uh, several states have goniometers, uh, so you can, if, you, if you're a government agency, like a city or a county, you might be able to talk your state into, hey, have you done a test on this? If you haven't, could you do one on it? Uh, they, they love doing tests on things. All right, so inspection. We talked about basics. We talked about measurement. Now we're going to talk about inspection. Troubleshooting bead disbursement. We just you, we did the, the one on thermoplastic. Now we're going to talk about beads kind of in the same aspect, with the same type of drawings. So if the beads are properly dispersed, they're going to be even evenly dispersed, evenly, even depths, even uh, coverage, and so forth. Sometimes you'll have one side's going to be heavier than the other, and if you're looking at that line, you'll see it. There's speeds missing on the right or left of that. Or you may have a, a heavy center. You'll have it on the edges, there's not beads. On the, in the middle, there are beads. Or you could have just the opposite, where it's light in the center and heavy on the edges. Unevenly dispersed. These are all incorrect disbursement. I'm going to tell you what they cause in just a second. Oops, sorry. All right. So what causes this? Nine times out of ten is a defective bead dispenser. A defective bead dispenser is not operating properly. Could be a low bead gun pressure. There's not enough pressure. That's why it's not pushing out the beads, the proper amount of beads. It could be an insufficient amount of beads in the applicator. It's, uh, it's basically starving the applicator, whether it be a, a drop-on or it be a pressurized system. There's just not enough beads in there. Or the beads, there's not enough beads in there to, to have that continuous flow that needs to happen. So those are usually the causes. Also, we find that a lot of times hand-applied beads look like this. Um, just try to, the only time you should be doing the hand-applied beads is 
you can do them on uh, on on lead and not necessarily legends, but like arrows uh, on the ends of the lines where the bead dispenser didn't start in time, or or you had to like for instance when you stop a line, your bead dispenser a lot of bead dispensers shut off. Well, there's still like an end of that line about a foot that doesn't have beads uh, top coated on it, so that can happen. Uh, so you want to be very careful with with the hand applied because it can it can look really bad. Now what you're going to have is you're going to see this visually at night because you're going to have a line that's either like reflective on one side, not on the other. You're going to have you're going to have this this line that looks like a real thin. It's supposed to be six inches, but it's only it really only reflects about four inches. It's got rough edges and everything. Well, that's like this heavy center here. That's what's going to happen. Or it's going to look like two little lines going down the road, like there's a gap between there. But then when you look at it closely, you see the the line's there, it's just you're not getting reflectivity. And then, of course, the unevenly dispersed, it's just going to be a, a sporadic and erratic line. All right, troubleshooting more. Uh, we're going to talk about, we talked about coverage. <coughs> now let's talk about depth. Proper bead embedment. Again, I've said it multiple times, and I've said it multiple times for, for good reason. 55 to 60% embedment. You'll have um, the situation where the beads are not in enough, uh, deep enough. That's usually caused because the material was too cold. The beads were put on too late, so they did not embed. Uh, too deep. Um, the, the beads are actually sinking into the thermoplastic, and that's usually because the material is too hot. You could have excessive disbursement. And that just means that there's just too many beads. Uh, the reason this is bad is because these beads tend to shadow one another, and so you don't get that, that color coming through. So you won't get retroflectivity. If you don't have any color, you don't have any, um, you know, if you don't have light, you don't have color. If you don't have color, you don't have visibility. So in this particular case, if you have too many beads, it can be a problem. A lot of people say, wow, if 10 pounds is good, then 20 pounds is better. And it's not always the case. Uh, you can actually have too many beads on the line. And then because, again, because they're, they're uh, clouding each other or shadowing each other, your reflectivity can go down. In fact, what you'll see is in many applications, especially on thermoplastic, uh, because the, the beads stick very well, uh, you're going to find that your initial readings could actually get better over time because those beads that are shadowing the other beads will go away. So be sure if you're doing an initial reading and the line was just put down, take a good stiff broom and sweep that line off it so you can break loose those, those extra beads that are laying on top. This is why 55 to 60% is so important. If you get over, if you're, if you're at 30% embedment, you're, you get no retroreflectivity at all. So those beads setting up there will not provide a reflectivity. 40% you'll get a little bit, 50 to 60 is perfect. Now you get into 70, 80, and 90, you get good reflectivity, but you don't have you don't have the, the, the surface area, so you're going to have less light coming back. If, if I was to make a mistake, I would want to make it on the 90% rather than the 10%, as you can see. And over time, that material will start to erode and expose those beads more. All right. Why thermoplastic? Why would we use thermoplastic on the job? We're in the, we're in the home stretch here, guys. Um, you're going to use thermoplastic because the specifications call for it. You're going to use it for safety because, it's again, it's not only a retroreflective marking, it's a durable marking, and not only a durable retroreflective marking, but one that continuously renews itself because the intermixed beads, again, as, as those old beads get worn and, and so forth, they fall out, and guess what? It exposes the new beads and service life. You're going to get a lot longer service life with thermoplastic than you will out of paint, for example. Specifications, federal, uh, minimum retroreflectivity standards coming around the corner, not here yet. Uh, many, many of the states have minimum retroreflectivity requirements, uh, but in the state, a lot of times if you're a contractor out there, which I believe was a, a, a significant percentage of you, a lot of state roads and even county roads require that if you have a stop bar that is an entry point onto my state road, it has to be retroreflective. 
And usually it's a stop bar and 50 foot of double yellow, for example. Uh, local, uh, local applications are a lot of times fire lanes, uh, besides the roads themselves, but even in parking lots that, that some uh, companies, or I'm sorry, some agencies are starting to say, I want our fire lanes in thermoplastic. Uh, so they'll always be there. All right, safety. Understand the pedestrians versus autos. We have over 4,000 deaths per year and 59,000 injuries per year from pedestrians being struck by automobiles. Uh, by the way, we have about 32, 35,000 people die a year on our roadways. Keep that in mind. Uh, specialty uh, or high emphasis markings is where you would apply thermoplastic on crosswalks. Let's say, let's say you have a program and, and you're trying to decide the expense of thermoplastic or the expense of paint, when should I use it? And that's what this is all about. You're going to use it either because of specifications or you're going to use it because of safety. And in this case, again, high emphasis markings, uh, crosswalks, uh, disabled parking, fire lanes, uh, directional arrows, exit and stop bars. Understand that, that these, the ones that I've asterisked here, which is crosswalks, um, directional arrows, and stop bars, if you're, not, if you're going to use thermal plastic anywhere, that's where you need to use them. And the reason is, is, is not just because they're in pedestrian hazardous areas, but also because these are usually within the wheel paths of the car and they wear very quickly and can become hazardous. Years of life, uh, just talking real quick about the years of life of the different materials. Uh, we've got paint here. It's going to last one to two years. Uh, you're going to use a high build, which is going to double that. If you, if you were in our 101 course, you know a little bit about those. Then you're going to use nine, uh, this, this is 30 mils of thermal plastic. The minimum thickness recommended by manufacturers and probably under what some would recommend. And then you have 90 mils is going to give you an extended life. So your 90 mils is, is uh, 90 mils or greater is what we highly recommend. If you're in a parking lot, uh, 30 mils is is excellent. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably the most cost effective. Um, you have at 30 mils, you have about four times the life of a standard um, waterborne paint. Uh, it cost of 2.7 times that paint. Extruded thermoplastic, you have about 8.5 times uh, the life of paint, uh, but you have a 7.3 times uh, the cost of paint. Again, though, on roadways, highly recommend 90 mils. On uh, on commercial applications, you know, you go with the 30 mils. Uh, increased danger. Uh, these are our concerns of thermoplastic. You have increased danger, extreme temperatures, propane fuel. You're dealing with, ladies and gentlemen, this is this is very dangerous. We actually, as uh, as a contractor, we had one of our propane uh, powered trucks uh, burn down melt down because we were using block material with cardboard boxes had to, got the cardboard boxes too close to the open flame next thing you know the propane is on fire and the cardboard's on fire and we just have to step back and watch the truck melt economic conditions um, that's concerns larger contractors for you contractors out there the larger contractors are taking these smaller projects for less money uh, startup costs are pretty expensive it's about two times that of paint labor factor, nearly about three times that of paint. Remember, you've got a slower process. You have, you have more, uh, more prep time as far as getting the, the material uh, heated up in the morning as soon as you walk in. You've got to heat that material up and, uh, and then get out to the job site. Extrusion is slower than painting, so you do have about three times the labor factor. And you have to have more expertise uh, in doing it. Material cost, uh, 2.7 to 7.3 times that of paint. So these are my concerns. Increased danger, economic conditions, this is the, this is the bad with the good. Uh, startup cost, labor factor, and material cost. Just real quick on profitability, I'm going to just show this chart. This is mainly for uh, you guys that are contractors and you're thinking about putting material on, uh, on your commercial parking lots. Uh, this, is, this is where uh, profitability comes into play. Your, your kind of your your, your sweet spot is going to be that 30 mils again. And just real quick, I want to show you a couple really cool links. If you, let's see, we'll go to first to the DAF scale. This tool, uh, we also have a, a, a webinar, if you are not familiar with it, it's a weather webinar, weather to stripe or seal coat. Uh, and what you can do here is you can go in, type in your zip code. Now, when you're putting down material, you have to be concerned of, of four major factors. Uh, what's the temperature? What's the humidity? 
what's the wind speed and what's the sunlight? All those play effect in evaporation and cool down. So we we have several DOTs that actually use this on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, I was I was at a meeting and I was talking to a contractor and he says, Oh, I hate that DAF scale thing. <laughs> I was like, oh man, that's not what I want to hear. He's like, well, I was out, we were ready to start a job, and, and the DLT, and it was really borderline, we knew it, but we needed to get it done, I didn't want to lose the day. And he said, the DLT guy came up to me, the engineer came up to me, and he said, I'm sorry, we cannot strike right now, and he showed me the staff scale, and, and thank you very much. So, sorry contractors. Uh, 32256, we're going to do this, this is our, our zip code in Jacksonville, let's see what today looks like. So all i got to do is click that in. And it's going to come up and give me my measurement for the day. Now you can see the 7 a.m. This is every three hours: 7 a.m., 10 a.m., 1 p.m., 4 p.m. Now we've already crossed these, so that's why they're they're dead. But in the future, we've got for 4 o'clock we're going to be at a 7 to a 7.08. It's a scale of 1 to 10, 1 to 5. Do not install 5 to 7. Install with care with care. And 7 plus is, uh, conditions are very good for application. If you click here, you can see the details. What, what is that? What is that based on? And you can go down here, and I'll tell you. Here's your your temperature range, your your uh, humidity, all these notes. These all say high, uh, but it's still rating out fairly well. It's 7.8. Now you've got uh, you've got some other things here that are that are coming out. So this is what it's based on. If you go down, you'll actually see the next day. This is all day tomorrow. Understand this little guy here. This is called a rain advisory bar. And what it does is if it's gray, it means that there's a 35 up to a 35 percent, I'm sorry, a 35 percent to 75 percent chance of rain. If it's black, it's a 75 percent or greater. The reason we do this, we don't actually put it in the factoring scale because rain is a hit and miss. It's going to be raining, especially if you're in the coastal areas. It'll be raining here and across the street it won't be. But we want you to be aware of the rain. Hey, if it says a uh, like this one is a 703, but it's got a little bit of a rain advisory. I'm saying, hey, make sure you're looking up in the sky, too, because you could have a problem there. Uh, this actually shows you the area that you're talking about. And let's say you've got to do work at night. Nobody likes to do that, but they have to do it. So you can go to DAF by night, and it's going to show you this evening. So tonight, for seal coating and striping, actually, you, you know, the whole night is pretty good. Just watch that rain advisory. It gets really low in this area. Understand the worse the conditions go, the longer it's going to take for your paint to dry, the longer it's going to take for your thermal to set up, and so forth. Also be aware that it's not just about the conditions at the time of installation, but also prior to the installation and after the installation. So if you've got a borderline uh, rating here, and you've got a, one that's a red and one that's a red either side, keep that in mind. For instance, if it was red prior to the installation, I would be concerned that there might be some moisture on the ground, so make sure you double check that. So this is called the DAF scale. It's a free service to anyone that wants to use it. It's dafscale.com. I'll show you one more thing. And this is uh, one of our cool tools. This is our website, pppcatalog.com. If you go to the Knowledge Center, you're going to see the DAF scale, which we just went to. You're also going to see these material calculators. This is an awesome tool for your thermoplastic guys. Now, we have a real simple, quick out calculator that everyone um, has seen probably on some website or another. And you can go in here and I can type in, oh, it's, uh, uh, I want to do 90 mils and my line width is going to be 6 inches. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, line, yeah, 6 inches. And my length is uh, 5280, one mile. <clears throat> I can say calculate. And it will tell me how much thermoplastic, how many pounds I'm going to use, how many tons I'm going to use, if you're buying it in the ton how many feet per ton you're getting, and how many tons per mile. So this is a, this is a quick calculator. It works for the, for the screed and, and spray. It has two different results. You can also do symbols where I'd say, okay, I'm going to do a, a stop symbol. How much thermal plastic am I going to need? And that's a standard DOT stop symbol. It's about 23.5 square foot. you got stop. This tells you how many pounds add different mills. So very cool uh, 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 a calculator for quick calculation. But the, but the better one is this one, Thermal Plastic Project Calculator. Guys that have used this love it. So you go in there and you tell it uh, you know, what, what the price of the thermal plastic is. I'm just going to put some prices in here. 
Uh, let's just do that. We'll go, all right, gives you a chance to do a double drop bead. Uh, so let's say type beads A is, uh, I don't know what we've got here, 904, uh, 1400, and then 10 and 10. Now, we can go over this with you individually, but basically what this is, is I just put in the pricing of my thermoplast, put in the pricing of my beads. If I've only got a single drop bead application, then I can take that out and it won't count. Uh, it doesn't matter if I put anything in there or not. But let's say it's a single drop bead application. I'm going to enter some white lane lines now. Now I'm going to say this is 90 mils. Uh, I'm going to go width is 6 inches. I'm going to say it's 5280. Oh, not 5, 5280. I'm just going to do one, uh, two examples here. Uh, we're going to do it in white. Uh, application, how are we going to do it? We're going to extrude this material uh, instead of spray. And then I'm going to go down. And I'm going to insert a symbol. Let's say we're going to do, uh, it's going to be a single drop application. And I'm going to do five stop symbols. Oh, sorry. At the thickness of 125 mils, let's say. And uh, let's do 120. We usually don't go 125. So we'll do 120. And I'm going to do five units. OK. By entering that, that information, I, I just hit enter by accident. Um, basically, you just hit calculate. And let me just pull it up like it was. So I go down here to the bottom. I hit calculate. And check this out. This is so cool. Down at the bottom, it tells you how many tons in, are, are needed of white material and your total price per ton and your total cost, how much of the yellow. Remember, I didn't do any yellow. It's all white. So it's there's no cost in there. So there's my total thermoplastic. Now beads, because I'm only using a single drop, this I'm going to need $124 worth of beads. The total job, the total project is going to cost me in materials $3,296.05 plus tax if you didn't put that in there or plus shipping if you didn't put that in there. Then you can go in and print the results. Very cool calculator. I hope you guys use it and find it useful. All right. And it is time for questions and answers. So let's uh, let's let's get them in here and see what we've got. All right, while we're Lynn, are you there? Yep. Um, while we're waiting for a couple more questions, we do have a few already in. But just a reminder: today's presentation was recorded, so you'll be receiving a link to that a little bit later today once it's ready. Um, you'll also receive a separate email with information. Um, we have some charts that were in the presentation that we'll send to you in a PDF. And if you would like a copy of the thermoplastic guide that Greg spoke about earlier, you can respond to either one of those emails with a shipping address, and we'll go ahead and get that out to you. As well, um, we also have some, Greg already showed you the Knowledge Center, but we have the PPP training webinars. You can click there and see what we have coming up and what's available on demand at any time. Uh, we do have the paint webinar that we did last week is on demand now. And we have another webinar coming up in August on pavement maintenance. We have a retroreflectivity webinar. If you're interested um, on the sign retroreflectivity, if you, if you do anything with the sign department, otherwise you can send your sign guys to the webinar landing page as well. Um, in September, we're planning on doing a weather webinar, which will go over uh, how the DAF scale is calculated and a few other important things to know um, to be able to decide, especially when we start getting into those fall months, uh, whether to stripe or seal. And then another webinar um, for the contractors out there will be discussing some ideas for marketing and how to expand your business. And so uh, with that, I do have a couple of questions for you, Greg. Already ready? Um, first one, uh, you let's see, can we purchase measuring devices such as the micrometers from your company? Uh, yes, I, the the specialty ones. I uh, honestly, I'd recommend that if um, if you're looking at just the standard micrometer that you would use it in the in the method I prescribed with the with the duct tape on the pavement and and then peel the duct tape back and measure it. I'd recommend buying that. We can sell you those, but uh, but you you can buy those from a local Granger or something like that. But when you get into the specialty devices, like the one that I showed you to the right of that, which is designed to to measure the markings in place, which is an awesome, uh, uh, 
awesome thing to be able to do. Absolutely, we do stock those and have them available for you. Um, you mentioned that the last step in pavement preparation is to put down a primer sometimes. Uh, what kind of primer do you recommend using? Uh, again, this is, goes back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, we recommend that you put down the primer uh, that the manufacturer of the thermoplastic uh, has approved. Uh, I would definitely contact my supplier or the manufacturer, depending on where you're buying the material from, and, and make sure that that's the approved material. Understand that because we have six locations in, in multiple regions, uh, we sell different thermoplastics in different regions. So we actually have to carry different primers in those regions. We're very careful to do that because we don't want any backlash from, hey, you didn't use the right primer. So, so I would, with the, the approved primer of the thermoplastic manufacturer is, is what you need to count on. Uh, do other primers work? Absolutely, but uh, it's just a, it's kind of a CYA situation. Okay. Oh, by the way, before, before um, I, I just want to mention, I don't know if you did there or not, uh, make sure that you guys, if you get an opportunity, I, I would really appreciate you filling out those surveys because that helps me to know what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. So as uh, when you log off and so forth, just make sure you take just a moment for me. I would really appreciate it. This is a free service, and, and uh, it, but we, we certainly want to know that we're, we're, taking a, we're, we're making good use of not only our time but your time as well. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Another question? Uh, when when restriping over other markings, do you need to mill the lines first? Uh, again, it depends on how well they're adhering to the surface and if they're compatible to the material. If it's epoxy, absolutely epoxy, epoxy uh, paint. Uh, you 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 certainly want to remove that because thermoplastic is not compatible with it. But other lines, other materials, uh, not necessarily only. If those uh, if those lines are uh, dislodging or not adhering well to the to the pavement surface itself, uh, that's the only time you really need to remove that. Is again when it's not compatible or when they're not adhered to the pavement well. And again, I recommend a rotary type grinder. There are other brands besides Smith, by the way, but uh, but that's certainly uh, the best one out there. What is the curing time for concrete prior to striping? During time prior to striping, uh, 28 days is, is the common uh, response to that, 28 days before you do anything to concrete. So, and it also depends a lot on the weather and the wear. Uh, asphalt and concrete both depend on, on rain. Uh, they depend on traffic. The more rain you get, the more traffic you get to an extent, uh, the faster it's going to cure out. So, uh, and, and, you know, and balance with good sunlight. So I, I, it just, it really depends. But uh, 28 days is is the is the number to use. The longer, the better, because a lot of times these curing compounds, uh, be careful when you're seal coating over concrete, because these curing compounds will be coming up. They get they get uh, placed on the material over top of it, and if you haven't given enough time for that stuff to wash off, you you have a good chance of uh, of sticking to the curing compound, but not to the surface underneath. Um, this is the last question, unless uh, if anyone gets in before you're done answering it. So, can okay. you quickly review the difference between extrude and ribbon again? Okay. Uh, remember, extrude is is uh, is governed by a die or a shoe, and the material is gravity fed into into the shoe, and that shoe has to maintain constant contact with the surface. The die within, or the the, the die bar within the die or the shoe is what controls the thickness and the width. So you can buy, for instance, if you have a four inch shoe or die, <laughs> sorry I go back and forth, but uh, it's the same thing, they're synonymous. Uh, but if you have a four inch die, you can actually change that die bar to be 90 mils, uh, 120 mils, and so forth. So that's that's how that works, is, is the, the thickness and the width is controlled strictly by that, that die bar, and it's gravity fed, no pressure, uh, opened. It's an open shoe. When you get into ribbon, uh, ribbon does not maintain contact. Uh, it lays the material across the surface just like a ribbon, like a preformed thermoplastic in a way. So it's a preformed material in the sense coming out, laying on top of the surface and melting it. Uh, the big difference is, is that 
Uh, you have more uh, above the surface control with extrusion, uh, but you have more speed with ribbon. Well, that was the last question, and I'd like to thank everyone again for taking the time to join us. I know this was a, a long presentation, but we do greatly appreciate it, and we hope that you learned something, and we hope to see you online again soon sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you. And don't forget, forget to fill out those surveys. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone.